So what is the general overview of your job here? Okay, so I am, uh, my name is Annie Gorgoni and I work with National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, what I do is, our group here is the Protected Resources Branch and I um, to study bottlenose dolphins here in mostly the Atlantic. Um, we try to get population estimates for different stocks of bottlenose dolphins um, to see how many there are, how many stocks there are, and um, trying to get an idea for different populations. Um, the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act states that we have to find this information out, and so what I end up doing is going out on a boat, taking photographs of dolphins and taking pictures of their dorsal fin, and we can match each animal up. They have individual dor dorsal fins. And then by using a whole bunch of lengthy math, we can figure out how many there are. <laughs> is that something like challenging, trying to take pictures of the dorsal fins of the dolphins? Yes, so you're on a boat that's moving. The boat is going up and down. The dolphin's going up and down in the water and going this way and that. And so, yeah, it takes perseverance and a good camera. And you have to focus in. You have to get really good photos of those animals. I can imagine with film cameras it was a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've done that. Yes, much harder. <laughs> hey, so um, was this, like, a job, something you imagined yourself doing when you were younger? Uh no, it wasn't. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and um, I ended up interning at a lot of different places, and I interned at a organization that did strandings in New York State, and I was the only intern that didn't get seasick, so they hired me on a whale-watching boat. And then after four years, I didn't know what else to do because I became really good at that. <laughs> and I do love it, so... I mean, it seems like a fun job to go out on a boat and just take pictures of dolphins. I mean, yes, there is a lot behind it, but that's something that's... Yeah, oh, absolutely, because you get, um, I, you know, there's so much that goes into it. You, you, you're you trying to collect this information to make management decisions that some sometimes if the population is too small, then they're going to shut off fishing because a lot of these dolphins get entangled in nets. And so if you have a small population and the population... Uh, is being uh, killed by some fishing activity, and then you have to close down that fishery, which in turn affects the business, the, the, the business and the fishermen, and they get mad at you, and it's 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 really it's difficult. And then when you're planning these huge projects, we went for a month in January trying to figure out this population in the southern North Carolina estuarine system stock, and um, you know there was months of preparation, and then all of a sudden the weather goes bad, and or people don't get along, or your equipment breaks, and you know, and sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, it's like a job, you know, you just get, but then you have to sit back, you're like, I'm out on the water, taking pictures of dolphins, it's not so bad. <laughs> get to enjoy the nice view. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next question I have is, uh, in your opinion, how important do you think it is, like, to have jobs like this? It, it, it's really important. You have to get an idea of what's going on in the environment and how, like I was just saying, how things are affected by different uh pressures such as fishing or in, or even environmental pressures if there's an oil spill uh the gulf of mexico there was a really that um deep water horizon and that affected a lot of the populations and um they didn't study many marine mammals down there before the deep water horizon and afterwards a lot of money came flooding in and they studied this one population that was hit the hardest and they're hardly surviving they a lot of the um animals they knew were pregnant never gave birth and um, so yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's kind of important all around. Did you know monitor how, especially how the way the weather's changing too, that does affect. Yes, we're doing a big project right now, trying to uh, figure out every stock. So that's a a population. Um, you have different species of of marine mammals here in the U.S., but then you also have stocks. So they may all be bottlenose dolphins, but um, you'll have different stocks that don't mix necessarily so um, some stocks are a lot smaller and some are a lot larger and so trying to uh, to figure out the effects on that so I don't know where I was going with that <laughs> <laughs> okay um, 
Do you think the quality of the oceans and marine life are changing in a negative way or a positive way? Definitely a negative way, and I see it now. I did some work down in um, Barataria Bay uh, in, in, um, in Terrebonne and Timberland Bay in Louisiana, and the we were driving over on our GPS the marsh, um, but we were not because we were on the boat, you know, and so the marsh is sinking and it's degrading and a lot of the um, there's a lot of fresh water coming in and a lot of these dolphins are affected by that um, and I think a lot of their food sources are getting scared out of there too and so I think um, with the water temperature rising now is uh, a lot of it's going to affect these populations. And do you think most of this changes from like humans as well and not just like natural selection no it's it's climate change climate stuff. change yeah well then yeah. the humans do affect the climate change right yes <laughs> so <laughs> um the next question kind of um relates to what like we do to affect it it's kind of like what does the world need to do as a whole to like change and make more a positive impact on the marine life oh my gosh yeah uh plastics in the ocean uh overfishing um Gosh, there's so much. The uh, again, the climate, the just the warming. There's, there's so it's almost depressing. Yeah. I think I read somewhere that there's almost almost more pieces of plastic in the ocean than there are fish. Yeah, it's it's horrible. And a lot when we used to do a lot of strandings, we used to um, do necropsies, which is like an autopsy, but on an animal. And uh, the the amount of plastic I'd find in stomachs was depressing. Because there's like <laughs> tiny pieces that you don't see. They just either on the beach or they get in the water and it's it's not good for the animals yeah yeah and the last question that i have is how does the commercial fishing industry affect the like the equilibrium of the ocean kind of like how the ocean is naturally yeah i think it depends on which industry you're talking about there's um something like the uh the bluefin tuna where um there's a there's a population that you're only allowed to fish a certain amount but that population goes all around the Atlantic and so this country fishes from it and that country fishes from it and that country fishes from it and so even though we're, we're monitoring and, and watching that population it's still being affected all around but then you have other small um, fishing commercial fishing that, that you see here in eastern North Carolina and um, some of that you can when you talk to Larissa about the sea turtles getting caught in the nets and, and there's a, a big um, so it depends on which industry you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like you know, obviously the animals that they don't intend to get caught in the nets, like the dolphins and the sea turtles, like that, that definitely yeah, affects well, them. Yeah, it does. They're, they've done this. There's a turtle exclus exclusion advice, the TEDs that they now put into the the shrimp nets that they have to have, and so um, that allows the turtles to escape. Um, and so I have a, a person here. He's not actually. He's in. El Salvador helping the fishermen down there put these uh, in their nets so um, all the fish that they catch you know there's no bycatch hopefully wait so. actually I just come up I just came up with one okay. more question um, has the government done anything to like help with like um, some of the populations that are like depleting or right um, so so we are part of the government so that the populations that we're that we, we get funded to study these animals and and trying to figure out what what's affecting them and sometimes they don't like our answers because <laughs> it affects the, the economic side of it with the business and the money making absolutely yeah and that's not something they want to hear yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh thank you for sure uh, doing this interview with me okay okay no problem Jennifer Potts. Okay, and uh, first question is, what is the general overview of your job here? Um, studying biology of fish, um, primarily our, my position is to make sure that we're aging fish that goes into stock assessments. Um, knowing what, the, what ages of fish are out there, how it's changed over time, 
um, when we've had a strong year class, which means we've had really good spawning one year or a series of years, then the data goes into assessment of our fish stocks out there to tell us about the health of the stock. And was this uh, job something that you imagined yourself doing when you were younger? Not specifically. I mean, when I was younger, I knew I wanted to work with animals, but I thought they were going to be warm, furry animals. (laughs) Like (laughs) dogs and cats. (laughs) Actually, uh, uh, bears, Bears. big animals, um, and uh, mammals in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I always had dreamed that I wanted to go to Africa and study the big the big animals. And like elephants and yeah. giraffes. Oh, yeah. I love elephants. Um, but I did take fisheries classes in college, and um, I, I enjoyed them, but I just never knew I was going to be studying fish. Mm-hmm. And um, my husband and I, after we graduated from college, we got married and we moved down here because of his job, and I got this job. And I have been here for 28 years, and I love what I do. So... I mean, it's got nice, nice location of the office right, right yeah. on the water. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. It is. It's different than growing up in the mountains. I miss the hills because the high rise bridge is the only hill we have. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy the job I do, other than the politics. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I grew up in New York, so this is a bit different being right on the water. I mean, I didn't grow up in upstate New York, but kind of on the island, not directly on the water, kind of in the middle, but. Okay. Because, see, I'm from the Utica area, but my family is all western New York, over near Buffalo. So we had the Allegheny Mountains and the Adirondacks and, yeah. Yeah, my um, dad was in, like, a hunting club up in the Catskill Mountains um, up in Woodstock. So we would go up there, like, in the winter when it snowed and just enjoy that. It's neat. New York is a beautiful state that people need to know more about. (laughs) It's very expensive to live there. Yes. But it's a very beautiful state, especially upstate and out um, in Montauk and East Hampton and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, So the next question I have is, in your opinion, how important do you think it is to have, like, jobs like this? I think it is important because, um, no, we're not the military and no, we're not, you know, health or education but somebody has to monitor the resource because we all enjoy, most people enjoy eating fish, um, enjoy coming to the beach, you know, doing something on the coast. And um, these jobs are important um, to be sure that people can enjoy, enjoy that resource or, you know, to, to fish from it or whatever use you want to have. But, um in my opinion, there's been um, a lot of uncontrolled, you know, growth of, you know, the population. You know, a lot of people like to be right along the coastline. And um, if we aren't out here monitoring what's going on, I think we would lose a lot of our, our um, habitat. The environment would suffer from all kinds of issues from that. Because I don't think people realize how important it is to keep up, make sure the environment is is the way it should be before we come in and with our big, you know, um, iron foot and put in all this technology, which is sometimes can be really bad for natural resources that we do have. It can be, but you know, it's kind of like um, each one of us is an individual, and we don't think about you know, the garbage we throw away. Especially the plastic. It's just one little piece, and I'm just one little person, but you multiply that by the population, and that's why we need to be more mindful of what we're doing. Um, You know, we've been given this this wonderful earth and um, the resources, and we need to, we do need to take care of it. Because we only have one earth. We can't have anywhere else to go. (laughs) Not yet, anyway. Do you think the quality of the oceans and marine life are changing in a negative way or a positive way? That's that's an interesting question. Um, um, In some ways, I think that the job that we're doing, that we're that monitoring the resources, we are getting better information, and we're doing better at you know, kind of coming up with policy or at least advising policy. I mean, we're just, the population is getting larger and larger, and there's going to be impacts everywhere. Um, 
I think we've done a lot to um, be more mindful and clean up the environment, but then in other ways, you know, things like um, offshore oil drilling and, you know, some of the, you know, we've got to balance the resource needs for, you know, what we want versus, you know, what's good for the environment. So it kind of, it, it swings, a pendulum swings a little bit, and mm. we just have to do our best. I, I don't know how to answer <laughs> that any better. So, And then uh, my next question kind of is kind of a part of the last one. It's, um, what does the world need to do as a whole to change and make like a more positive impact on the marine life and the ocean? Education, just being more mindful of, you know, what you're doing. Like we were talking about, you know, I'm just one person, but you multiply that by, you know, the whole population and, and you know, just, just being really mindful of what we do. Um, and, you know, we've become a consumer culture. Um, we we, we got to have it now. And we need to take a step back and... Um, realize that there's going to be a feedback if we abuse it there's going to be feedback or um, it's just going to disappear and then we're going to be like what happened yeah i mean we've already seen the impact on you know other environments with you know strip mining or even over harvesting of animals in some way whether it be fish or mammals or whatever that um, all of a sudden they're not there anymore and what do we want do we want the diversity or do we want to become you know, nothing more than, you know, say, roaches or, <laughs> I mean, you know, take yeah. them away, what's left, yeah. And then the last question I have is, how does the commercial fishing, how does the commercial fishing industry affect the, like, the equilibrium of the ocean? Well, um, it can certainly have negative impacts because, you know, um, fishing removes, um, the, the animals from the ocean, um, <clears throat> specifically fish, and if we're, but in some regards, it can also help, it, it, can, it can go both ways. It can help the environment by it can, um, you know, keep diversity coming in. If you have too many top level predators, you know, um, sharks are coming back and people are, fishermen are seeing impacts of sharks coming through because they're affecting the resource that they're after. Yeah, their food. The food. It's the shark's prey, but it's also your prey, you know, what we want to catch. Um, so in one sense, um, fishing can help, you know, keep a balance there, but then, um, unregulated fishing can really hurt it. Especially since we take them out of the oceans in such large numbers, kind of. Mm-hmm. As you know, you see those big fishing nets, and all those fish are in there going in that one boat, and then you multiply that by however many other boats that are out there doing right. that. And that's where management and regulation comes in, because, you know, I think of Menhaden is, is one of those that's a big purse thing, and, they, and these fish school. Um, but they have high... Repro- they reproduce very quickly. They only live to, m- the majority only live three to four years. It's kind of like sardines. I mean, it is it is the prey item. Other fish want to eat it, but we also go and capture it. But there's not that many boats left in, in that fishery. So that's where management regulations come in to help figure out how to meet that equilibrium that you're mm-hmm. talking about. Um, striped bass was a fish that um, was severely overfished in the 70s and 80s and they and by the 90s they were closing the fishery completely up and down the east coast well the stocks are rebounding they're coming back it's a success story but it started affecting the menhaden which because that's a main prey Mm-hmm. And we have a menhaden industry, and the fishermen are like, well, we can't find menhaden. Are the striped bass eating all of our fish? So, you know, it's just, it is, it can help, and it can and it can be bad. So. Especially since maybe some of the regulations might um, upset some of the fishermen because it, it's a money business. It is a money business, and economics is, we have economists on staff who actually look at those questions because... Yes, we are affecting people's livelihoods. 
our biggest, um, probably our biggest challenge right now is getting a better handle on recreational fishing. One, more and more people have their own boat. More and more people are going out recreationally fishing and there's not a very good survey of what's going on out there. And a lot of people who don't, you know, they just think of um, commercial fishing. You know, the big boats, those guys are, that's their business, so they're good at it, and they take a lot of fish. Well, actually, they have a lot of regulations put on them. In the recreational sector, we don't have a handle on it. And again, that goes back to, I'm just one person catching fish from my boat. But you multiply that by every person out there doing that. And if you don't have a count of those fish, we're missing a huge sector. Um, The commercial fishermen, it is their business. And the majority of them want their business to continue. So they actually are doing better at adhering to regulations. It's the recreational fishery that we got to get a better handle on. Especially when it's so easy to get a fishing license. I can just go down in Moorhead and oh, just yeah. go and get one. Everybody can get one. Yeah. Can get one. Um, how many of us pay it? You know, it's on us to know what the regulations are. But somebody comes from Raleigh and comes down to the coast and gets their saltwater fishing license and they go out there fishing. Did they really pay attention to the regulations? Or... I'm only down here this one weekend. It's okay if I keep one flounder that's undersized because I finally caught a flounder and I want to keep it. It, Not to say say that that's a general rule, Mm. but again, if we don't have a good handle on what they're catching, we're missing a huge sector of the fishing. And actually, a lot of recreational fisheries out catch commercial. Because there's so many of us compared to everyone that's in commercial fishing. And the commercial fishing guys, like I said, it's their business. They want it to continue. They're going to adhere to regulations. And in some regards, the commercial guys have more regulations on them than even the recreational. Which makes sense. So, but, um, yeah, we have to be careful not to paint the commercial guys in a bad light because it's not, it's not all them. It's yeah. us people who go out on Sundays and, you know, or on the weekend and just casually fish. Yep. Yep. So, but. Okay, well, that's all the questions I have. Thank right. you for your no, time. No problem. with your your name okay my name is Larissa Evans okay and what is the general overview of your job here I'm a research fishery biologist and I focus on studying sea turtle populations and the two main aspects of my job are to go out and catch turtles so that we can tag them and measure them and collect samples to uh, analyze different parts of their their population characteristics and then also to analyze growth marks and their bones to see how quickly they grow and how old they are uh, was this job something you imagined yourself doing when you were younger? Um, I think when I was younger, I definitely knew I wanted to work with turtles in general. It's been a long-term interest, but I didn't anticipate at that time the exact nature of the job, so I never would have imagined that I would be analyzing bones, for example, <laughs> as opposed to just studying the animals. Um, in your opinion, how important do you think it is to have jobs like this? I think that it is important to have um, agencies and jobs like the ones that we have here because a lot of times in society those things that get the most attention are those that have like an immediate monetary value and there are um, things in the environment that are important to us that aren't quite as easily quantified but we still need people and agencies to be monitoring those things to make sure that they don't just disappear <laughs> without anybody realizing. Uh, yeah, that way, like, you know, it's monitored that way. They don't, like you said, they don't just disappear and then it's like, what happened? A surprise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think the quality of the oceans and marine life are changing in a negative way or a positive way? 
I think they're they're changing, and in some areas it can be positive, and some areas it can be negative. Um, there are a lot of populations of animals that are shifting their distribution right now in response to the fact that temperatures and conditions in different parts of the ocean are changing, so they might be doing okay, um, but it's just different from what it was. Um, in other aspects, things aren't going as well because there is so much pressure on the populations of organisms in the ocean in terms of pollution and human activity. It makes it hard for them. Do you think global warming has kind of like an impact on the Yeah, so, so climate change definitely. Um, there are long-term records looking at um, currents and temperatures throughout the oceans in different, different areas. Things have changed quite a bit. So one of the areas that I was focusing on studying um, in collaboration with a, a researcher in France most recently was along the Atlantic coast of France. The temperatures have increased significantly over the past decades. And so they've seen subtropical species moving into this area where in decades past you never would have had those mm -hmm. species there. So there, there are definitely effects um, that are happening because of these temperature changes. Because some people I talk to, even my parents, are kind of just like, global warming or climate change it's it's non-existent but like there's a lot of supporting evidence that's out there that they're just kind of not really paying attention to right so there um, is a lot of evidence supporting the fact that the climate is is changing um, a recent study that just came out in the past couple of weeks dealt with the fact that the Gulf Stream which is a really important influence on our coast has been slowing down um, and there are two you know these two recent studies different lines of evidence are supporting um, this occurrence, which then has major implications for current cycling in the whole North Atlantic Ocean, which is, you know, it, it there are lots of physical data that support the fact that it's occurring. <clears throat> and I, I think at this point, a lot of people are still discussing what's causing it, but the fact that it's happening is less, you know, under dispute yeah. at this point. And I think humans do have a big impact on the way the climate is going, especially since we have a bunch of like stuff that's it, it doesn't degrade very quickly in the ground like the plastic so the plastic is definitely influencing the environment and that's one thing so studying sea turtle populations you know we um a lot of these turtles eat jellyfish um, particularly in the early parts of their lives although there is one species that focuses on eating jellyfish throughout its entire life and plastic things look a lot like jellyfish and so a lot of the turtles that wash up dead will find bits and pieces of plastic in their stomachs and whether it causes their death, you know, that's not clear in some cases, and some it's very obvious, but it's not good for them to be eating plastic. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's... There are chemicals in it that are going to affect their health, and also it's something called nutrient dilution, where, you know, the stomach is trying to digest something that's making it maybe feel full, but the nutrients, and it's not it's getting not any there. nutrients from it, so... They're not getting what they need. Because yeah, it's all man-made, it's not, it's not food. It's yeah, not digestible, <laughs> that's definitely not food. Um, so uh, the next question I have kind of um, branches off from the last question. It's, um, what does the world need to do as a whole to change and make a more positive impact on the marine life? Right, so really evaluating, I mean, people love to live at the coast, and that's where a lot of the pressure happens. And it's, you know, each individual person, their individual footprint may not be that big, but collectively it's, it's big. So that needs to be appropriately evaluated in any sort of you know, chemicals, flowing out, trash, all those things, you know, need to be um, not controlled, but just taken into consideration. I mean, you can't have a healthy marine environment when you're, you've got all this runoff, you know, coming down the rivers into you're the marine garbage. environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's something that people really need to consider. And then also in terms of fisheries, you know, where where your food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So there are different organizations that have initiatives for, um, you know, proper seafood, you know, or seafood that's sustainable. So there are certain fisheries that are more sustainable than others. So maybe, you know, paying attention to where your food is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of, again, kind of branching off, kind of, um, how does the commercial fishing industry affect the equilibrium of the ocean? So it, it, it can, it doesn't always, um, particularly in the U.S., we do have agencies, both state and this federal agency, maybe Jennifer talks a little bit about this, um, but, you know, where you have 
uh, agencies that are monitoring the status of the fisheries and kind of there's a feedback loop where if it seems like things are getting too, the, the catch is too high, they'll come back and have regulations on the fishery to kind of step back for a little bit until the stock can recover. Um, so in, in those cases, you know, things can be sustainable. In other cases where, you know, particularly in the open ocean, sometimes it's just a free for all, mm -hmm. things can get fished out you know, to the extent where it's not sustainable anymore. So for example, bluefin tuna, because they swim all around the whole ocean basin, you know, and they can get caught. The fish that get caught across the ocean in the, you know, even in the Mediterranean, you know, that has an impact on the population that you might see here in the U.S. So that can, those sorts of things might get out of control more quickly because it's not one regulatory oversight, it's much more broad. So do you think recreational fishing kind of needs to be monitored more than commercial fishing? Because there are a lot of regulations with commercial there fishing. There are, yeah. So commercial, fi or commercial fishing ends up having the most focus because it's a discrete population of people that can be observed and, and regulated. But recreational fishing is a, a huge um, impact as well, potentially. But because it's, again, and every individual person, their individual footprint isn't that big, but collectively, I mean, we do have a lot of, of, of recreational fishermen, but we don't really have an idea um, as well how they're impacting the stocks and um, what bycatch is happening. I mean, we do know that some sea turtles are caught on hook and line, for example, but not exactly how many or what the yeah. effects might be. Because it's a lot harder to monitor that. Than yes, so we need more information, for sure. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Okay. So thank you for <laughs> sure. your time. No problem.